Good evening and welcome to our Waltham Public Library program, Lung Cancer Early Detection Matters. My name is Deborah Hoffman and I organize programs and events for the library. Thanks for tuning in. Before we start, I wanna let you know how the evening will go. Our speakers will do a 30 to 40 minute presentation and then they'll field questions. To ask questions via the chat function, use a Google account to sign into YouTube. Feel free to write your questions at any time and then I'll read them at the end of the presentation. Dr. Hugh Auchincloss received his medical degree from Harvard Medical School in 2008. He completed his general surgery and cardiothoracic surgery training at Mass General Hospital and joined the Division of Thoracic Surgery in 2018. His clinical interests include minimally invasive and robotic approaches to lung cancer, esophageal cancer, gastroesophageal reflux, and tumors of the pleura and mediastinum. Sean Lear is a graduate of the Duke Physician Assistant Program and the Norwalk Yale Surgical Physician Assistant Residency Program. Her areas of interest include early detection of lung cancer. She is the physician assistant for thoracic surgery and coordinator of the lung nodule clinic at Newton Wellesley Hospital. Rosanna D'Onofrio is the pulmonary nodule navigator for the lung cancer screening program at Newton Wellesley Hospital. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Thank you very much for the invitation to speak here tonight and on behalf of uh, Sean and Rosanna as well, just to say that this is a topic that we're all passionate about, the early detection of lung cancer. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. <clears throat> all right. We've decided to speak tonight about lung cancer screening, specifically why it works and who it doesn't work for. Uh, so again, my name is Hugh Auchincloss. I'm a thoracic surgeon at the Mass General Division of Thoracic Surgery. Uh, I also uh, have a practice out of um, Newton Wellesley Hospital, and I'm joined in presenting these slides by Sean Lear, who's the coordinator of our lung nodule clinic, and also Rosanna D'Onofrio, who uh, coordinates our early detection clinic. The objectives of today's talk, first, we'd like to define screening, specifically screening in the context of uh, cancer programs. We wanna say, does screening for lung cancer make sense? And then answer the most important question, which is does screening for lung cancer work? Let's begin by defining screening and the rationale for cancer screening programs. So by definition, a screening test is designed to detect cancer um, in people who are asymptomatic or what we would say is the preclinical stage. And the goal of that early detection is to intervene on a cancer at an early stage with the idea that it's going to improve the outcome. The most common examples are mammography for breast cancer and uh, colonoscopy for colon cancer. Um, other things like pap smears for cervical cancer have been in wide practice for many years, and most people are familiar with these. Lung cancer screening is a little bit newer. Now, in general, we think prevention is the ultimate goal for all disease, but yeah, when prevention isn't possible, we think screening ought to be better than the alternative, the alternative being waiting for patients to become symptomatic before diagnosing their disease. This leads to the obvious question. You know, I think most people don't have a hard time understanding why screening for cancer would be a good idea. In fact, it leads to the much tougher question, which is why wouldn't you screen for every cancer? Why wouldn't you screen everyone? There's some obvious answers to that. So one, it's just very expensive, but there's also risk to patients. So there's risk uh, that comes in the form of discomfort from the screening test itself. The screening tests cause anxiety and they may lead to unnecessary procedures. Um, but I wanna go over in some more detail two harder to understand risks or, or difficulties with screening. The first is kind of a math problem. It's very hard to screen for rare cancers. and I, I, like to demonstrate that visually. And the second is screening for a lot of cancers may actually lead to overdiagnosis. So detecting cancers without having an impact on the way that they're treated. Um, and I'll give you two examples of those. 
first let's drill down on this. It's hard to screen for rare cancers. And this is, a, I think, a difficult point for um, certainly to explain. So I, I came up with this hypothetical. Um, let's imagine that you have a very rare cancer. We'll call it cancer X. And it only happens in one in 10,000 people. And you develop a screening test to look for cancer X. And it's a very good test. So it picks up 100% of people with cancer X. That is to say, it doesn't have any false negatives. If you have cancer X, the test will be positive. But one in a thousand times, the test will be positive in someone without cancer. So that's called a false positive, And it has a false positive rate in this case of about 0.1%. That's a very accurate test, probably more accurate than any real test. But because there are some false positives in this hypothetical, we're gonna say that if the test is positive, a different, more invasive test is needed to confirm it. That more invasive test is 100% accurate, so no false positives and no false negatives, but it has a serious complication one in 100 times. Now let's just do the thought experiment. What happens if you screen 10,000 people looking for cancer X? Here's your 10,000 people. You're going to find about one in 10,000 people that have the cancer. But you're also, because of false positives, gonna get 10 additional positive tests and you're not gonna know who in this population is who. Um, so you have 10 false positives, one true positive, um, and you have to, do an additional test on all of these people again to pick up the one person who actually has the disease. Meanwhile, the rest of these people suffered the anxiety of being told that they had a cancer that they didn't actually had, have, and they had to go through another unnecessary and invasive test. And maybe this one person in red had a significant complication from that test. So you can actually do real harm searching for rare cancers like that. You can improve your odds. So what if you could limit the population that you tested, you screened for? What if you found out that a certain population, hypothetically, people with red hair had a higher risk of cancer X? It happens in one in 500 people. Now you can just screen redheads and you'll get the same uh, number of true positives, but you'll get far fewer false positives. So it's much more likely that a positive test would be a true positive and your test will have a much higher yield. So in general, if you can limit a screening test to a population that has a very high prevalence, um, which is the percentage of disease in the population, you're going to decrease the cost of the test because you don't have to administer it as often, but you're also going to dramatically improve the accuracy and therefore decrease the harm that comes from false positives. So that's one reason why you wouldn't screen for every single disease. Another is this problem of overdiagnosis that you may end up discovering a lot of disease that you don't actually change the course of. Uh, two examples of that are what we call lead time bias and length time bias. And again, these are difficult to, to describe and so better done visually. But basically the principle is not all cancers are gonna behave the same way. Some cancers grow very slowly and patients will go on to die from some other reason. And we would say those patients die with rather than from their cancer. But if you screen them for these cancers, it's gonna seem like at first you're having a positive in, uh, impact on survival. Now, how, how can that be? So in the example of lead time bias, I've laid out each of these lines here represents a patient who in the green circle silently develops a cancer. And in the blue triangle later in their life, develops symptoms of that cancer that make it clinically apparent. And at the red stop sign, they go on to die from their cancer. So this purple dashed line is what we would represent as the amount of time that we think they survive from their cancer, because we didn't know about it in this stage. So this is diagnosis to death. And so we would call this survival. What if we started screening everyone with this orange box? So everyone's gonna get a screening test at this point. So everyone has their diagnosis made a little bit earlier. They go on to live exactly as long as they would have, the stop sign doesn't shift, but the blue dashed line, the time that we're aware of the disease, increases by a measurable number. 
So in this case, it went from five years to eight years. It looked like we were having a positive impact on survival, but we didn't move the stop sign at all. Another example of this is what we call length time bias. This is based on the premise that some patients have very aggressive cancers where they will develop their disease and go on to die from it very quickly. Whereas some patients will develop their disease and have a very long period in which they live with their cancer until they die from it. And if you do a screening test all at one point, you'll have a much greater likelihood of picking up patients with these long courses and you'll miss entirely a small subset of patients that have very aggressive disease because they either hadn't developed it yet at the time of the screening test, or they had already died from their cancer. So if you just do a one-time only screening test, you'll have a tendency to pick up slower versions of the disease that will make it look as if the disease, the survival from the disease is improving just by adding a test. Now, these might seem like very hypothetical um, situations, but in fact, they're very real. So for these two reasons, we don't screen for, for example, prostate cancer anymore. Because what we found is that by screening for prostate cancer, we were subjecting patients to this lead time bias phenomenon. We were diagnosing prostate cancer very early. We weren't doing anything about it. Patients were living longer with the knowledge of having prostate cancer but we didn't actually move the stop sign at all. So we were detecting a lot of prostate cancer, not doing anything about it and not changing survival. And length time bias is why we don't screen for thyroid cancer because there are a lot of patients that have very aggressive forms of thyroid cancer that wouldn't get picked up in screening tests necessarily. And then the more common form of thyroid cancer has this much longer form, Oops, sorry. And uh, it initially looked like we were having a positive impact on survival, but in fact, we weren't. So it's just a reminder that in both of these examples, the stop signs stay the same. In both cases, we didn't change survival. And since we're in the business of moving stop signs, that is one significant hurdle to screening for, for a lot of cancers. So what is an ideal situation for cancer screening? Well, you want a cancer that is very prevalent. It's very common that's gonna maximize the public health benefit of the screening test. And ideally you'd like to know risk factors that allow you to specifically identify high risk groups because it's hard to screen entire populations and it's hard to screen when the prevalence is low. If you can find populations in which the risk is much higher, that's gonna improve your test. You need a screening test that's reliable, that's safe and ideally is cheap. Um, because you want to minimize that false positive uh, risk. You want to minimize the risk to patients from undergoing the test, and you want to minimize the cost to the system. And then most importantly, you want really good evidence that intervening early at a preclinical stage of disease is going to improve the stop signs. So you want to move those stop signs, not like we did with prostate cancer. So does screening for lung cancer make sense, given that criteria? So is lung cancer prevalent? Yes, lung cancer is the second most common type of cancer in the United States. There was about 230,000 uh, 230, new cases in the United States in 2020, um, second only to breast cancer. It's the deadliest cancer in the United States and the world. So there was about 136,000 lung cancer deaths in the US in 2020, making it the leading cause of cancer death. And there were 1.6 million deaths from lung cancer worldwide. And as we said, we can really identify some high risk groups. We're aware of the primary risk factor for lung cancer, which is of course smoking. Do we have a screening test for lung cancer that's reliable, safe, and cheap? We do. So um, the uh, lung cancer screening test is a yearly low dose CT scan. Um, as I said, performed annually. We previously tried to screen for lung cancer um, with sputum samples. So you would cough into a jar and we would look for cancer cells and that did not work. Or with chest x-rays, um, that did not work because both tended to pick up cancer at late stages. Um, but now we've moved on to low dose uh, CT scans performed every year. When I say low dose, it delivers about one to four millisieverts of radiation. And to put that in context, it's about a fifth of what a normal CT scan would deliver. 
And it's only about 15 x-rays or the equivalent of flying across the country 50 times or just six months of background radiation. So we don't think that that is a harmful dose of radiation for any person. Is it reliably reported? Yes, we've standardized a system for reporting the findings of lung cancer screening CT scans. We use a lung rad system, which is known to every radiologist in the country and which is highly reproducible so that one radiologist reading a scan here and one reading one in Florida would arrive at similar conclusions and be able to speak the same language about their findings. And what about the problem of false positives? So they do occur in lung cancer screening CTs, but they usually only require follow-up CTs, um, occasionally a biopsy or a more invasive procedure is needed. But in general, the screening test is safe to patients. Oh, shoot, sorry. Yeah. All right. On to this much more important point. Is there good evidence that intervening at early at an early stage of lung cancer, a preclinical stage, is better? So does this move the stop sign? So let's first start by saying what we mean by lung cancer and lung cancer staging. So what do we mean by an earlier stage? So lung cancer in general falls under a category of diseases that we call bronchogenic carcinoma. So cancer that arises from the bronchus or the airway. It's broadly subdivided into two large categories. The first is small cell lung cancer, um, which represents about 15% of all lung cancer cases. Small cell lung cancer is almost exclusively seen in patients with heavy smoking history, um, and it tends to be very aggressive. Um, and so most of my work as a surgeon um, tends to focus on this other larger basket, which is non-small cell lung cancer. That represents 85% of uh, lung cancer cases. Underneath the umbrella of non-small cell lung cancer, we have several different cell types. So there's uh, adenocarcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma that make up the bulk of uh, different cell types in non-small cell lung cancer, and then a host of uh, more rare histologies. It's also important to note that lung cancer screening and lung cancer staging does not refer to um, these other diagnoses up here in the gray boxes. So things like mesothelioma, which is a cancer of the lining of the lung, tumors of the thymic gland, which sits in the chest, tumors of the chest wall itself or the ribs um, or soft tissue, or cancers from other parts of the body that have spread to the lungs. So these are all things that we might see on a lung cancer screening CT scan, but they are not the purpose of lung cancer screening CT scans. Um, the purpose of lung cancer screening CT scans are really to detect this group, this non-small cell lung cancer group. So what do we mean by lung cancer staging? Um, this is my schematic figure. This is uh, his lungs and his airways and the rest of his body. My first patient here is going to have a tumor in the upper lobe of his left lung. This is what it might look like on a CT scan, this shadow here overlying the top portion of the, the lung. Importantly, what we don't see is any spread to any other sites in the body or any of the local lymph nodes. This is a classic finding that's picked up on a lung cancer screening CT scan. Um, and this is an actual patient of mine. We would call this stage one lung cancer, lung cancer that's limited entirely to the lung with no spread whatsoever. It's treated with surgery or sometimes in uh, certain patients with radiation. And when you treat it at that stage, the survival is excellent. So uh, 70 to 90%, probably closer to 90% of patients can expect to be alive um, in five years. Our second patient has a slightly larger lung tumor. And then when we look more closely, she has spread to these lymph nodes that cluster around the windpipe that we would call mediastinal lymph nodes. This is her actual CT scan involving a large tumor involving the upper lobe of her left lung. And we can see on these PET images, which make um, cancer cells light up, we can see light up in the tumor itself, and then some spread to that lymph node that clusters around the windpipe here. This we would call stage three lung cancer. It tends to be treated with a combination of chemotherapy, radiation, and surgery in some order. 
And though we've improved a lot in how we treat this disease, the survival is still significantly less good than it is for stage one disease. So about 33% of patients would be alive in five years after being treated for stage three lung cancer. And our final patient has not just a tumor involving her right upper lobe and spread to several lymph nodes in her chest, she has spread to another site in her body. This is what that might look like on a CT scan, um, tumor in the right upper lobe, and then this PET CT scan showing spread to the adrenal gland on the opposite side. This we would call stage four. So this is metastatic lung cancer. It has spread throughout the body. It tends to be treated with chemotherapy um, or increasingly targeted therapy and immunotherapy but we still haven't made a huge impact on the survival of this disease. So the five-year survival is still less than 10% um, for all comers. And this is uh, not the CT scan of one of my patients. This is the CT scan of my grandmother from 10 years ago um, when she presented with uh, a hemoptysis. She was coughing up blood. This predated the time of lung cancer screening. And just to illustrate the, the improvement in survival by stage, this is, these are those trends uh, shown graphically. So stage for stage, like most cancers, early stage disease has much better survival. If we can detect lung cancer at an early stage, survival is dramatically better than if we detect it when it's uh, uh, spread. So we've established that catching lung cancer at this early stage is crucial, but we have a Big problem. So early stage lung cancer is usually asymptomatic, or if it does have symptoms, they tend to be very subtle. So some patients with early stage lung cancer may have cough, or they may have some mild hemoptysis coughing up blood, but it's often confused for pneumonia, may be confused for an exacerbation of their emphysema or COPD. It's often overlooked. And the symptoms that are harder to overlook, like chest pain and shortness of breath, swollen lymph nodes, things like weight loss and fatigue, those are all signs of advanced disease. Still, most patients, 60 to 70% of patients with lung cancer are gonna have advanced disease at the time of presentation because patients that wait to be symptomatic, almost by definition, are gonna fall into that group. So preclinical detection, detection at a pre-symptomatic stage is really key. So we've established the rationale for screening programs, and we've established that screening for lung cancer really ought to make sense, but does it work? Does screening for lung cancer work? The answer is a very definitive yes. So this was the first major study that looked at that. In 2011, the results of the National Lung Cancer Screening Trial were published in the New England Journal and encompassed uh, about 10 years of a study period. And these patients were smokers that were randomized to either have yearly low-dose CAT scans or to undergo standard screening with x-rays. And they concluded at the end of their study that the use of low-dose screening reduced the mortality from lung cancer. How much? Well, so they followed 53,000 high-risk patients. High-risk is defined by smoking history. They followed them for 10 years, and they discovered that in the group that was screened with CAT scans, the risk of dying from lung cancer was 20% lower than in the other group. A 20% may not seem like a huge amount, but it's mammoth to us. Um, when you consider the burden of disease from lung cancer, a 20% risk reduction is just enormous. There was a problem with false positives. Almost 19 out of 20 positive CT scans turned out to be false positives. And those did lead to additional tests, but usually they were just additional CT scans. Um, it was very infrequent in the study to see harm come from the screening, um, either in the form of additional procedures or from the screening itself. This has been replicated in other studies since then and with even more impressive results. This is the most recent large one came out of Europe. Um, it's called the Nelson trial. Slightly smaller study, but with just as much uh, um, effect. And in fact, so they screened 13,000 men and 2,500 women, very similar protocol, yearly low dose CT scans. 
And this time they decreased the um, risk of death uh, in men by three quarters. And in women, it was actually two thirds. Women had a better benefit from screening. Um, and we've seen that replicated in other studies as well. It seemed that we were under screening um, women before. Most of the cancer that was detected in the Nelson trial was early stage, which is uh, what it should be based on a screening study. And this time, what was interesting is 10 years later, there was much, many fewer false positives. So in the intervening 10 years, we had really improved in our ways of interpreting CT scans such that um, we were finding fewer false positives. And as a result, no harm came to anyone in the screening population as a result of false positives. So not only does lung cancer screening work, it actually works better than any screening test that we have for any disease. A number that we commonly rely on is uh, what's called the number needed to screen. So how many patients would need to be screened for a disease to prevent one death from that disease? In colon cancer, that's 5,000 people would have to have a colonoscopy to prevent one death from colon cancer. In breast, it's 1,300 women would have to have a mammography to prevent one breast cancer death. But in lung cancer, it's only 300 patients that need to have a lung cancer screening study in order to um, prevent one death from lung cancer. So we would consider this to be the most effective screening test we've ever devised. With that, I want to turn it over to Sean Lear, who's our um, lung nodule clinic coordinator, to talk about who is eligible for lung cancer screening and most importantly, who is not. Thank you, Dr. Achenkloss. Um, so this is a good diagram that shows you who, who qualifies for lung cancer screening. Um, as Dr. Achenkloss said before, we know that we want a high-risk population, and that high-risk population is smokers. So um, do you mind going sorry, back? Sean. To, that's okay. Um, so we know you, to qualify, you have to be a current smoker or have quit within the past 15 years. If you quit longer than that, then you don't qualify. You have to have a 20 pack year smoking history or more. And that means that you smoked one pack of cigarettes a day for 20 years, or you smoked two packs of cigarettes a day for 10. Um, and then you have to fall between the ages of 50 and 80. And in addition to all of that, you have to not have symptoms of lung cancer. So you're not coughing up blood, you're not having chest pain sorts of things. So what about everyone else? We're seeing more and more lung cancer in those who were never smokers and young people less than 50. Uh, it's uncommon, but it's no longer something we would consider rare. The screening guidelines weren't intended to be exhaustive and include everyone, but rather to maximize the value of the test. So we know approximately 10 to 20% of lung cancers occur in those who were never smokers. Um, non-smokers make up approximately 30% of new non-small cell lung cancer cases, which is up uh, doubled since the 70s. Uh, women make up a large percentage of non-smokers with lung cancer, and an extreme example of that is in Japan, 60 to 80% of women who have lung cancer were never smokers. Uh, this trend isn't exact. We know that old cancer registries didn't accurately report smoking history, so we're working with the best data we have. So what are some other risk factors for those who were non-smokers? So first, secondhand smoke exposure. Often the women who had lung cancer were never smokers lived with a spouse who was a smoker. We know radon gas exposure increases your risk for lung cancer. Um, indoor cooking fires. We think this might be a reason why uh, in Asian women population, female populations, we have um, a larger number of lung cancer, um, one reason. And outdoor air pollution, and then exposure to things at work like asbestos, chromium, arsenic, chemical solvents. And then what about your personal history that might put you at higher risk? Um, if you had cancer before and you had prior radiation, particularly to the chest area, so say you had breast cancer and had radiation to, um, to your breast, you'd be at increased risk of having a lung cancer or chemotherapy which affects all cells in the body. Um, kind of interesting, and there's not a lot of data to support this one way or, one way or the other, is um, having a prior HPV infection. So we think that that may increase your risk of having developing lung cancer in addition to developing gastrointestinal cancers. 
And then lung disease, it's not related to smoking, like pulmonary fibrosis and dermatomyositis. Those might put you at increased risk. And then another explanation possibly for women, more women developing lung cancer um, in that non-smoking group would be hormones. Does estrogen play a role? And again, we don't have a definitive answer. Um, but what we do know is that most of uh, those who were non-smokers have uh, mutations in their and the cancer cells. So going back to this slide, um, I think this is actually the same slide as the smokers. So I think it's actually more closer to um, small cell lung cancer would be even fewer in that non-smoking group, closer to six to 8%. And so that puts the non-smoking, I'm sorry, the non-small cell lung cancer group to greater than 90%. Um, and then adenocarcinoma ends up being more than half. So near 50 to 60% of that non-small cell group. So again, uh, most lung cancers and non-smokers, particularly those who are young, is, um, are adenocarcinomas. Uh, note adenocarcinoma, as you saw on the other slide before, is also very common in smokers too, but tends to have a more even split between the other types of lung cancers. Um, non-smokers with adenocarcinoma often have a driver mutation. And that could be uh, the EGFR, CRAS, ALK, or MET mutations. So uh, what are some implications for treatment? Cancer behave more aggressively, but now we have this whole class of medications that target, that, that, um, that target those mutations. So we have third generation EGFR and ALK inhibitors. And recently we have a new um, target towards the MET um, mutation. Um, <clears throat> so results have been promising. We know that people uh, tolerate these targeted drugs better than they target chemotherapy. And um, the survival is approximately double if you have one of these mutations. So implications for treatment. In addition to targeted drugs and chemotherapy, the most important development in the treatment of advanced lung cancer is immunotherapy. So immunotherapy allows us to boost our own immune system to fight the cancer itself. Unfortunately, for some reason, non-smokers with adenocarcinoma aren't responding well to the immunotherapy. The reason why we're not sure could be related to receiving, um, to the cancer being caused from an outside source, such as you know, cigarette smoking. We're just not sure. So driver mutations, chemotherapy, and immunotherapy all apply to advanced stage lung cancer. We want to diagnose lung cancer before it gets to advanced stage. And non-smokers, we don't know how to do this. So what can we do better? We can identify populations who are at a higher risk. Maybe it's women. Maybe it's people of color. We can understand the effects of other risk factors like radon gas we mentioned, vaping, e-cigarettes, which are becoming... Um, more popular and used more widely, particularly in our young population, marijuana, occupational chemicals that you might be exposed to. Um, we'd also like to improve, we could improve the existing screening tests that are here, make the CT scans cheaper, make them more accessible, and maybe easier to interpret with um, artificial intelligence. And then discover a better screening test. Maybe we can do this with a blood sample or a breath test or sputum test. So to end on a positive note, all in all, we're seeing a decrease in mortality from lung cancer. Um, this is likely driven, this is driven from um, the fact that we've been doing lung cancer screenings. So some conclusions from this talk. Lung cancer screening, it makes sense. Lung cancer is common and it's deadly. We understand and maybe not well enough who is at high risk. The test to screen for it is accurate and it's readily available. Lung cancer treated at an early preclinical stage is associated with vastly better outcomes than those with advanced stage lung cancer, as mentioned. Lung cancer screening works. Lung cancer outcomes are improving. Early detection is a big part of this. But we need to do more for our non-smokers. Who to screen and how to do it. Better prevention and better treatment for advanced stage disease. And we'll end it with that and open it up to any questions. Thank you both so much um, for that for that presentation. It was really um, 
really informative and it's really helpful to hear um, about the trend towards making um, screening for lung cancer the norm. Um, I do have some questions for you. Um, can, uh, can you talk about how PAC years are calculated to determine eligibility for lung cancer screening? Sure. So um, if we, so let's say you have a 10 pack year smoking, or let's go with 20 because that qualifies you for lung cancer screening. Um, so if you, like I said, if you smoked one pack a day for 20 years, and this is approximate, then you would have a 20 pack year smoking history. If you smoked two packs a day for 10 years, then you would also have a 20 pack smoking history. Um, I don't know if you guys have a, another way <laughs> of explaining it. It is an accumulation too, right, Sean? I mean, there are people who start and stop smoking, um, right. but once you accumulate those pack years and you stop, those pa that pack year amount stays the same. Um, it does not go down when you quit smoking because that is your overall average smoking history. So they're trying to determine how much a person, it's a, a process to um, just put a, a number to how much a person smokes. And just to follow up on that, that's probably one of the reasons that we weren't looking hard enough at lung cancer in women is because we knew that there was a dose relationship between smoking and cancer risk. So the more you smoke, the higher your risk of cancer. But for women and possibly for non-white populations as well, that curve may be lower. So women may be at risk for lung cancer with a lower exposure from uh, to low, lower total exposure to cigarettes. Okay, and just to follow up on uh, one thing that you said in your um, presentation, Dr. Achenklaas, uh, there was a caveat about number of pack years, but also um, how recently you had smoked. Um, if you had quit smoking a certain number of years in the past, you were not eligible. Did I get that right? You did, and it's unfortunate because I don't think any of us really believe that that um, is a legitimate way to um, exclude people from screening. So currently the guidelines say that if you quit smoking greater than 15, I'm looking at Rosanna to nod along with me. Yes. 15 years ago. Greater than 15 um, years, yeah. Then you know all, you are no longer eligible for lung cancer screening because your risk of lung cancer isn't high enough anymore. But I think most of us that treat lung cancer believe that your risk never really returns to that of the non-smoking population. And we would prefer to continue screening everyone regardless of their quit time. Yeah. Um, this is a question from the audience. Um, if I'm not a smoker, have no obvious symptoms, not much secondhand smoke or cooking fire exposure, what should I be doing? Should I have no concern about developing lung cancer? And um, this is written by a man. It's impossible to have no concern, particularly from where I'm sitting as a lung cancer surgeon. I, I worry about all of you. Um, the honest truth is that your risk of lung cancer in that scenario is still very low. Um, it is um, very low and probably no higher than any other number of cancers that are, are common, things like colon cancer and, and pancreatic cancer. Um, so there's no specific need to be worried about lung cancer, but do I wish that we had a perfect uh, screening test that we could use to look for cancer in someone just like you? Absolutely. And in terms of prevention, you've already done it all. So you didn't smoke, you took good care of yourself, you stayed away from the things that we know increase your risk. Um, there isn't much else you can do. Okay, thank you for that. Um, for how long does an individual need to be screened? Um, or to put another way, when should screening stop? So screening should stop if you don't um, meet those 
qualifications that we mentioned before. So um, if you have quit now, we've been um, losing you, Sean. We're losing your audio. Uh -oh. um, so this the screening should stop when you no longer meet those requirements um, for blood cancer screening. Or if you were to find a positive uh, result, you wouldn't have any intentions of doing anything about it. So if you were to find out you did have cancer and you didn't want to do anything about it, then there would be no reason to continue lung cancer screening. Okay. Helpful. And the upper so, limit of um, age is 80. Is 80. Right. If you're over 80, then you no longer qualify. Um, uh, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid just published their updated guidelines. And unfortunately, um, they have determined that they will no longer cover screening once a person is 78 years old. So um, all the other elements for um, meeting the eligibility guidelines match up between the private and commercial payers, except for Medicare, Medicaid, they stop screening at age 78. So that makes it a little tricky now because it's no longer the exact same guidelines for um, everyone. Their, your insurance coverage now will, will make a difference in whether or not you get to have that screening between the ages of 77 and 80, unfortunately. In okay. general, you know, guidelines about when to stop screening for any disease are based on they're based on whole populations, but they don't apply very well to individual patients. So the idea being that an 80 year old in general is probably not going to live more than 10 years. That's just a population estimate, but we all know lots of 80 year olds for whom that is clearly not true. We know 80 year olds who are gonna live another 30 excellent years. And we would love to continue to screen patients that fall into that group because intervening on their cancer when they're 82 may dramatically improve the quality and quantity of the life they have left. But when you're the Center for Medicare and Medicaid and you're looking at the entire population, you say, well, in general, 80 year olds don't live very long, so we're not gonna screen them anymore. Got it, okay. Um, here's another question from the audience. Um, I was a light smoker. Uh, averaged five cigarettes per day for over 20 years, and my dad passed away from advanced lung cancer. He was a smoker as a young adult, but had quit several years prior to diagnosis. Can I be screened? You're still um, uh, bad audio, Sean. I'm not sure, sorry. But I'll, I'll pass. Mm -hmm. Uh, un unfortunately, it depends on how liberal you're willing to be with what you described to your primary care physician. So no, we're not here to encourage anyone to embellish their smoking history, but I think you should be screened with that history. Um, but you may find that by not meeting any hard guidelines for screening that your insurance company is unwilling to do so. To, to cover the cost of a screening test. And that leaves you with a choice of either paying out of pocket for a study that I think you deserve, or maybe you have a you know, mysterious cough that your primary care physician says needs to be evaluated with a diagnostic CT scan. So then we're no longer talking about screening. We're doing a CT scan to look for a specific problem and it serves the same role. So. When, when possible and when ethical, I do encourage some degree of flexibility in how people report things. Okay, helpful. Um, a follow-up to that is, is lung cancer screening covered by insurance, by most insurance? Can jump in on that one. <laughs> Um, so for most, um, as I said, for most private and commercial payers, like the big ones, Blue Cross Blue Shield, Tufts, United Healthcare, um, because the USPSTF um, has given lung cancer screening a grade B, um, they are obligated to cover the screenings under the preventive services, which is part of the Affordable Care Act. 
Um, I always encourage patients to speak with their providers to make sure that screening is right for them. And then to just do their homework and reach out to their insurance provider and see if it's covered you know, with their policies. Policies can get very specific um, and it, it should be covered, but you always wanna just double check to be sure. Um, as long as you meet those guidelines, you, it should be covered. Um, for Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, they are also following those guidelines um, and it should be covered as long as you meet those guidelines. Okay, thank and you. And actually it should be covered, I, sh I should say, um, one screening per year. Um, if there is, um, if it's given a lung rats assessment or three or four requiring an earlier follow-up, then that would be considered diagnostic and it would just fall under diagnostic or routine imaging. Um, so they may have a copay or a deductible that, that applies, um, but they will be able to get that early follow-up. But for the most part, all the insurance companies that do cover according to the eligibility guidelines will cover one screening per year. So that's with you know 12 calendar months. Okay, helpful. Um, can, you, uh, can you talk about the risk of lung cancer for, um, caused by radon exposure? That's one of the hardest ones to, to quantify. Um, so there is a big radon belt that goes to the northeast part of the United States up into like Minnesota and through Canada. And we're sitting more or less on it. Um, and so almost everyone who lives around here has some exposure to radon in their basement. When you radon proof a basement, I only found this out recently, you don't actually get rid of any radon. You just put fans in so that it blows the sort of ambient air out of your basement. Um, and it's it's clear that in areas where there is a lot of radon exposure, lung cancer rates are ever so slightly higher, but it would be very hard to find an individual patient and say your lung cancer was caused by radon um, because the, the result, the, the effect itself is so small. So we, we put it there as a risk factor, but no one knows quite how much. And can you talk a little bit more about the, um, you touched on this in your talk, but about the increase in lung cancer in non-smokers, particularly women, particularly Asian women. We're seeing the same trend in colon cancer as well, um, increasing diagnosis in young people for um, aggressive colon cancers. And I would say, um, that we don't have a great explanation as to right now what's causing that increase. In lung cancer, it's easy to get fooled by the percentages. So because smoking has decreased in prevalence um, as a risk factor, people are smoking less. Lung cancer in general is going down, whereas the percentage, you know, the number of patients who didn't smoke that are getting lung cancer is remaining the same or slightly increasing. Um, and so the percentages are dramatically increasing, but the actual absolute number of people that didn't smoke that are developing lung cancer is probably only slightly increasing, but it is increasing and we don't know why. Um, the, the screening program that's in place now um, is specifically for smokers. Um, can you just talk about what you hope to see for screening in the general population, you know, in non-smokers uh, down the road and, and whether you think that will happen and what that might look like? Yeah, I would love to have, what we would love to have is the perfect test. The one that is cheap, that never yields a false positive. So we can give it to everyone and not hurt anyone with it. And I think some of the most promising areas here are with um, either blood-based assays. So looking for um, circulating uh, either tumor DNA in the bloodstream that might pick up even very early stage lung cancers very reliably, or um, 
something that's gained a lot of interest recently is uh, volatile chemicals that you might expel with your breathing since cancer of the lungs forms in the airways it stands to reason that some of those that cancer material the cancer byproducts must be expelled when you um, breathe out and we know this actually because in um, patients with at least advanced stage lung cancer who have a lot of cancer cells you can train dogs to recognize the smell of their breath um, as a marker of cancer so you have cancer sniffing dogs um, that, that can do that. So there is clearly organic chemicals that are being expelled when patients with cancer breathe out. The problem is right now we can only pick them up in very high levels, which only helps people with a lot of disease. But I think someday we will get to where everyone can breathe into a machine and even you know, the most microscopic amount of that chemical will be picked up and it will be reliable. And do you think that that breath test is um, closer in time than a blood test? Um, my gut instinct is no, but uh, I would love to be through our eyes. Okay. Um, most important message that you want to leave our audience with tonight? Well, we know a population that we can screen incredibly effectively for lung cancer. Um, so the people that meet all the criteria that we discussed, we're still not screening enough of those people. So of the people that are eligible for lung cancer screening, only about one in 20 are getting it. And I'm looking again at Rosanna for agreement um, with that statement, but I think that was the most recent number. Only 5% of people who are eligible for lung cancer screening are getting screening, even though we know it works so well. We're doing so much better with things like mammography and colonoscopy. We're really good at implementation there and we've lagged way behind with lung cancer screening. So if you know somebody who based on this criteria qualifies for lung cancer screening, or maybe with a little bit of massaging of their quit date might qualify for lung cancer screening, please encourage them to have lung cancer screening. That's a great message. Um, I wanna thank you all again for um, speaking with us tonight about this really important topic. And I wanna thank everyone who tuned in. Um, have a good evening. Thank you very much for the invitation.